The idea that mutations are considered the engines of evolution has only one problem. There's no evidence to support it. Um, as far as we know, and that's a considerable problem, not an overwhelming problem for a scientific theory. There are plenty of scientific theories that lasted a long time with absolutely no evidence. Um, but the idea that, that mutations are the driving force encounters are fatal difficulties. Almost all mutations are deleterious. Almost all of them do the organism absolutely no good. In fact, we have a devilishly hard time finding any mutations that do the organism any good whatsoever. That's one problem. The second problem is that by now we should be um, attentive enough to look for uh, contrived circumstances in which we can test this idea that mutations, by definition random, by definition random, um, work as the engine of evolution. What we have are a variety of lifelike systems, books for example, or computer, uh, computer codes. And what we know is that unless we do a lot of careful stage management, arbitrary events in either books or computer codes tend to screw the code of the book up irreparably. Now there's a, a large question here. If I take a copy of Windows um, 2000 XP and I start introducing random changes, uh, within a very short while, the code will crash. The whole system will be useless. Why exactly is this not happening in living systems? I, I don't want a lot of hand-waving in response. I want a precise quantitative answer. Living systems don't experience catastrophic failure under random mutations because. And if you know, tell me. I'll take your call day or night. Let's look at the thing this way. What, what does the Darwinian theory say? What is the Darwin, Darwinian anecdote? There are arbitrary changes, meaning the changes are perfectly random. We have no idea when they will occur, and they're not linked to changes that have occurred. And after the changes have occurred, there's a deterministic process which calls out those changes that are valuable and saves those changes uh, which are not, uh, and extrudes those changes which are not. So the process is both one of sheer dumb luck, finding the right changes, and something that is not quite a matter of luck, that is quite deterministic, that is saving the valuable changes. Nonetheless, Darwinian theory suggests that each such episode, luck, change, luck, change, is independent. It has nothing to do with the one that went before. So that in the abstract, it could be modeled by what mathematicians call a random variable. At, a, at first cut, first approximation. When I talk about sheer dumb luck, I mean the amazing fact that these extraordinary, ineffably beautiful structures arise from what is at its heart a stochastic, that is to say, a random process. Now, no one is arguing, say, that if a tiger, a toothless tiger, develops a set of splendid dentures capable of biting its prey, it will improve its chances of survival. That seems obvious. It seems, in fact, so obvious that it's hard to imagine that a scientific theory is needed to explain it. The pigeonhole principle explains it. The pigeonhole principle tells you if you have ten letters and only nine mailboxes, one letter has to go. That seems to be at work in Darwinian theory as an underlying assumption as well. Hardly need a, a hundred years of biology to tell us that. But the essential point is that the structure of the theory is uh, arguably stochastic. Each event, each episode, each bright bursting episode of change is independent of the one that went before and independent of the one that's going to come after. That's what I meant by sheer dumb luck. A hard time imagining that I myself am the product of sheer dumb luck. I like to see, uh, think of all of evolution groaning its way toward the accomplishment of the noble and lovely thing that is me. But of course, as a critic of Darwinian theory, I, I don't hold with that. Um, of course, I find it difficult to imagine that any contemporary state of affairs is the result of essentially a random process. Um, not difficult for theological, not difficult for religious, not difficult for any reasons of the sacred, but difficult because we have an enormous amount of experience with the underlying kind of processes in mathematics and statistics, and we never see anything like that. I imagine that uh, Juan Luis Borges, the famous writer, was offering an account of the origins of every contemporary novel. And uh, as is wont, um, he, he argued that all novels are really one novel, that is Don Quixote, and that all novels would, were derived from the Quixote by random copying changes in an obscure group of Cistercian French monks. Um, 
When I wrote that, I wanted to poke fun at Darwinian theory, but the more I thought about it, the more it seemed perfectly reasonable that that should be the account of the origins of the novel. Uh, you began with Don Quixote in the 15th century, 16th century. You had groups of monks who didn't speak any Spanish, didn't speak any French, um, copying it, as medieval monks, uh, monks copied the Bible. And they introduced copying errors. And sure enough, after a certain amount of time, Don Quixote changed to War and Peace. Uh, different language, different notation, different elements, um, but essentially a process of copying errors. Um, if we find that preposterous, and I certainly do, a little shiver could, should go up our backs when we think of the analogous, an, analogous claim being made in the context of biology. The idea that uh, science is a uniquely self-critical institution is, of course, preposterous. Scientists are no more self-critical than anyone else. They hate to be criticized, and they never criticize themselves. Um, Given, given the, the, the enormously long span of human history, this is um, a prediction that one would expect to be true, and it is true. Uh, there are local mechanisms of criticism in science. I mean, within established theories, if somebody publishes data that um, don't work out in the right way, or if there are mathematical flaws in a certain theory, uh, these tend to get known. But large global criticisms of the scientific enterprise are very, very difficult to find, and uh, certainly are not being promulgated by the scientists themselves with any great ebullience or enthusiasm. Look, these people are only human. They hate criticism. Me too. Me too. It's not a surprise. Um, the idea that scientists are absolutely eager to be beaten up, that's one of the myths uh, put out by the scientists, and it works splendidly so that they can avoid criticism. If somebody's got a lot of money at stake, a lot of research money, the words, uh, I don't have a clue, are guaranteed to end his, his or her funding. Um, if someone is relatively free to say exactly what they, what they feel like saying, yeah, there are people who say, we really don't know. We're really in the dark about this. So a lot of it depends on the institutional constraints of science itself. We're asking for standards of behavior that it would be uh, wonderful to expect, but that no serious man actually does expect. A uh, hundred years of fraudulent drawings suggesting embryological affinities that don't exist, that's just what I would expect if biologists were struggling to maintain a position of power in a secular democratic society. Let, let's be reasonable. We're all sophisticated men and women here. I mean, the, the, the popular myth of science is a uniquely self-critical institution, and scientists as men who would rather be consumed at the stake rather than fudge their data. I mean, that's, that's okay for a PBS special, but that's not the real world. That's not what's taking place. I mean, people fudge the data whenever they can get away with it. Uh, and they, they will uh, commit themselves to fraudulent drawing just so long as they're convinced that no one's looking over their shoulder. And it's, it's unrealistic, unsophisticated, and unwise to expect people to do anything other than that. Think of your last traffic ticket. Yeah, you bet, officer. I was doing 98 miles per hour <laughs> in a 30 mile an hour school zone. When was the last time you told the cop that? And yet we expect the biologist to say exactly the same thing about uh, drawings which have been his stock and trade for the last hundred years. The much more relevant question is how, how is it that we live in a society where uh, the point of view, the splendidly cynical point of view I'm adumbrating right now is not common wisdom, and we don't look more closely at what these people say. One of the reasons that people embrace Darwinian orthodoxy with such an unholy zealousness is just that it gives them access to power. It's as simple as that. Power over education, power over political decisions, power over funding, and power over the media. No one in a society which is openly contemptuous of religious expression in any form, wants to be identified with the side at which the intellectuals and the uh, leaders of taste and opinion are going to snicker. This again is human, human nature. We would not expect a philosopher to be boisterous in his denunciation of Darwinian theory if it could cause people at the faculty club to whisper about him. And that's exactly what we find. Tremendous amount of pressure uh, in this society or any other, to conform to socially accepted beliefs, strategies of um, evidence, appraisal, and the like. 
Well, well the idea that, that the scientific enterprise is, is governed by a majority of opinion, it's not entirely a foolish idea. I mean, we can't, we can't get rid of it uh, completely and say that the truth is so unassailable that it can be discovered by one individual uh, inevitably running against uh, the tide of every other individual. There has to be some consensus in some points of view of science. Um, and, and to suggest that the fact that so many biologists are willing publicly to endorse Darwinian theory is of no account is foolish. Uh, to a certain extent, I do agree with that. It, it is important to present uh, within an educational uh, establishment, what is the standard, the mainstream, the canonical view? There's, there's no question about that. But at the same time, for heaven's sake, let's open up the discussion a little bit and present some countervailing views, at least to the extent of, of um, appraising Darwinian theory um, in the context that realistically portrays it for what it is, a kind of amusing 19th century collection of anecdotes that is utterly unlike anything we see in the serious sciences. That would be my favorite position. Um, yeah, biologists do agree um, that this is the correct theory for the origin and, and um, diversification of life, but here are some points you should consider as well. One, the theory doesn't have any substance. Two, it's preposterous. Three, it's not supported by the evidence. And four, the fact that the biologists are uniformly in agreement about this issue could as well be explained by some solid Marxist interpretation of their economic interests. That would satisfy me. It's not asking for much, is it? We don't know anything about the progress of science. Um, as far as we can tell, it depends on... Uh, unique, unrepeatable events, the confluence of genius and inspiration. And um, in between those unique and unrepeatable events, there's a lot of patient work of accumulation uh, of data, facts, theory, testing, assessment. Um, it's not even clear that science is progressing. Um, it, it, might be, it might be moving in a circular pattern, ever, ever um, uh, deeper entrenchment of a, a single set of ideas. That certainly seems to be true in physics. Has physics progressed beyond Newtonian mechanics? Well, it's certainly been enriched. It certainly has uh, acquired additional concepts, additional powers, whether the powers are due to technological development or theoretical insight is another issue. Um, I don't think we should make any large claims about the progress of science. We understand science as little as we understand the cosmos. I think, realistically speaking, we're hundreds of years away from having the same kind of understanding of living systems uh, as we possess in parts of physics. And what we understand of physics deals with a very, very small range of experiences in the material world. That shouldn't be forgotten. And also, I turn on the faucet. I don't have a series of equations that can describe turbulent water flow. I just don't have that. Um, aerodynamics is not properly understood. Turbulence is not properly understood. And that's Newtonian mechanics. We certainly don't have a, uh, a rock-solid understanding of the behavior of technological material objects in the contemporary world. There are a lot of anecdotes. No reason to expect progress in biology is going to be any more um, rapid than uh, developments in physics. Why the assumption of celerity, that things should just happen, bang, 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 we'll, we'll understand everything at once? There are very deep conceptual issues in biology, very, very deep, very profound areas, not only of ignorance, but of understanding. This is a country with all too much civility. It really is, especially on important issues. But look how much we've lost in this country. I would encourage you to this. Go back to the 1920s, 1930s. Pick up anything that H.L. Mencken has written, for example. Robert Ingersoll, H.L. Mencken, a um, handful of critics, and ask yourself, could one write this way today about important issues? And we've lost something in this country because we've become afraid of controversy, afraid of polemics. That's not a healthy thing. It's invigorating. <laughs> the question whether name-calling is evidence of an imaginative paucity is hardly a fair question to put to me. I mean, because um, I revel in the name-calling, and when I don't have an argument, I tend to um, abuse my opponents just as easily as they tend to abuse me. Again, I, I don't think too much should be made of that. Um, there is um, a pattern. Uh, it's not a scientific pattern. It's a pattern in human affairs. When people haven't been criticized in a long time, they react with a great deal of indignation when they're criticized for the first time. It's human nature. 
Uh, I mean, uh, put yourself in the position of a Daniel Dennett or a Richard Dawkins who are used to being uh, the regnant priests of a powerful orthodoxy, and uh, for the first time in their lives someone says, hey, you guys are simply not credible. Of course they're going to react with outrage and indignation, uh, hurl uh, imprecations at others. A resort to objurgations. That's that's only normal. If, if I remark that Daniel Dennett had a, had his last idea in 1936 and it was under prenatal influences, what's wrong with that? It just sharpens the debate. It puts a lot of emotional um, emphasis on the debate, and it forces people to come up with something better. That's the real point of name calling. It forces people to come up with something better. There are other factors at work: decline in standards of uh, vituperation. America used to be a country rich in insults. It really did. And we lose something in literary or intellectual culture when that's, that's no longer accessible. Um, you get a guy like Daniel Dennett, whose greatest intellectual achievement was growing that stupid beard of his, uh, masquerading as a, as a scientific expert on Darwinian theory, staring at the camera, and no one is dousing him with a bucket of water. It's incredible to me. Richard Dawkins is accepted as a great intellect, and a fine prose stylist, too. The guy writes, I mean, his prose resembles a string of sponges strung together on a wash line. Should be said. Should be said. This isn't a question of, of, uh, of hatred. It's the question, the question of the effect of expression of indignation. There's no reason a democratic society has to be afraid of that. Go after the guys. Uh, we've become very defensive, very timid. I mean, look, the fact that we have to justify an attack on Darwinian theory is a very sad commentary on the health of American society. It shouldn't require a justification. It shouldn't, and yet it does. And a very timorous, uh, very timorous aspect to American society right now. It's gone to the black community, um, and that's a wonderful thing. Uh, but no community in America has a um, mastery of, um, of, the, of the contemporary language of invective, insult, argo, as, as the black community does. Trouble is not enough of the guys in the black community are devoting their talents to attacking Darwinian theory or quantum mechanics. That's the trouble. Get these rappers off MTV, put them to work, focus direction on Darwin. Somebody's going to get discouraged in high school because he's dealing with a muttonhead as a high school biology teacher. Uh, he better not go into science at all. Uh, it really is a tough field. There's a lot of abuse. It's a very difficult enterprise. And uh, you shouldn't be discouraged easily. Um, the only thing you should take from your experience is the standing refutation of the doctrine of the survival of the fittest that every high school instructor in biology provides. Uh, you know, every education is experienced not only because of your teachers, but in spite of your teachers. I mean, I remember myself as a high school student, uh, dumb as a post, completely inarticulate, incapable of reading, uh, certainly incapable of writing. Um, and I rather suspect my experience is pretty general. I mean, not many people are enthusiastic about contemporary high school students. That's one point. It's a factual point, whether they are or are not capable. But certainly in a democratic society, the idea that the high school has to be um, a, a kind of enlarged locker room where only the coach's pep talk is considered reasonable, that should be repugnant. That's not really how we want an educational establishment to, to be run, is it? Um, Let's give high school students the benefit of the doubt. Let's say that they're a whole lot more intelligent, presentable, better dressed, better groomed, smarter, more sophisticated than they give every appearance of being. What's the, what's the loss? What do we risk? Just what do we risk if some of the, um, the profound, exciting, deeply perplexing, uh, vexing issues of biology are presented honestly?